Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Retina Roundup. I'm Dr. Renu, fellow in Vitio Retina and ocular oncology. I'm going to take you through this month's top six articles. Starting with the first article. Number three is a randomized controlled trial to assess the safety and effectiveness of photobiomodulation in dry AMD. Subjects were given multi-wavelength photobiomodulation at 590, 660, and 850 nanometer on sham treatment delivered in a series of nine sessions over three to five weeks every four months over 24 months. The subjects were assessed for efficacy and safety outcomes, and the data from the 30-month analysis was presented in this report. A total of 100 subjects, that is 148 eyes with dry AMD, were randomized. Light side 3 met the primary efficacy BCVA endpoint with a significant difference between photobiomodulation and the sham groups. The difference between the group was 2.4 letters, with photobiomodulation alone at 5.4 letters, sham alone at 3 letters. The photobiomodulation group showed a significant decrease in new onset geography atrophy. Thus, they concluded that the photobiomodulation therapy in intermediate dry AMD showed improved clinical and anatomical outcomes. Moving on to the second article, the study was done to assess the efficacy and safety of combining both intravitreal zip apribercent and suprachoroidal injection of primes and non acetonide using a custom made needle in naive and de novo central diabetic macular enema patients every eight weeks for 24 weeks. The CMT was measured via STOCT and BCVA by a stellar chart at baseline for 8, 12, 16, and 24 weeks post injection. Additionally, they also analyzed cataract progression, IOP, and the ocular safety. A total of 10 eyes of 6 patients were treated with the above injection. Mission improved from 0.69 log MAR at a baseline to 0.39 log MAR after treatment. CMT significantly decreased from 2.3 plus or minus 166 micron at baseline to 362.77 plus or minus 7.6 micron at 24 weeks post injection. Thus, they concluded that the suprachoroidal injection of prime cellulose site using a custom made baby with intravitreal agent zip aflibert to treat de novo or knife central DME has favorable outcomes and adequate safety results. Moreover, this also had the benefit of extending the interval between anti of treatments from four to eight weeks, which could prevent further expenses, especially in low-income countries. Moving on to the third article, this study was done to demonstrate a novel surgical technique that is a low-cost alternative to commercial implants for macular buckling in high myopia. They used a silicon encircling band which served as the anchor and a second silicon circling band was employed with a 10 mm silicon strip to widen the posterior scleral indentation. This is inserted posteriorly. The lateral and the inferior rectus muscles were pushed behind the globe, orienting it into suprotemporal to infronasal position with the silicon strip directly under the macula. This was done under a microscope. They found out that the placement of the macular buckle led to reattachment of the central retina in treated patients during long term follow up. This also eliminates the need for detaching of the rectus muscle. Thus, they concluded that this customized macular buckle technique can improve the anatomical outcome in patients with central RD due to high myopia. Moving on to the fourth article, this study was done to evaluate the clinical outcome of subretinal autologous INM transplantation during PPD for persistent full thickness macular hole. This was a retrospective consecutive case series of 13 eyes of 13 patients undergoing small incision with retinal with ILM transplantation and air tamponade for large persistent full thickness macular hole after prior unsuccessful with with posterior hyaline detachment and ILM healing. SDOCT of the macula were performed before surgery, one and four weeks post surgery, and at the final follow up visit. Additionally, age, gender, axial length, macula hole band data, biomicroscopic fundus evaluation, and the best corrected visual acuity at baseline was evaluated at one and four weeks post surgery and at the final follow up visit, and all these values were analyzed. They found out that anatomical closure was achieved in all 13 cases, that is 100% success rate. The mean baseline BCBA log mark was 0.93. The mean post operative BCA log mark was 0.66. So the mean post operative follow up period of 11.4 months and no reopening occurred during the observation period. Thus, they concluded that placing an autologous ILM transplant in the subretinal space beneath the margin of the full thickness macular hole can support anatomical restoration and functional improvement in large persistent full thickness macular holes. Moving on to the fifth article. 
studied the efficacy of the use of perfluorocarbon as a temporary tamponade agent in severe ocular trauma or complex retinal specs. This was a scoping review which was conducted regarding the use of PFC in VR surgery as a tam temporary tamponade in subjects with severe ocular trauma or severe RV who received a therapeutic intervention compared to vitrectomy without the use of PFC as a temporary tamponade. The outcomes of interest were RD, visual acuity, post-operative complications, and retinal toxicity. The search was performed in renowned databases like Medline, Medline in Process, and other non-index citations, Medline Daily Update, and base databases. And reference lists were also included, which was from relevant review articles. After the elimination, they included eight articles, and two selected articles corresponded to adult studies and six to studies in humans. And of these, five were case series and one was a cohort study. Thus, they concluded that PFC as a short term tamponade had high rates of reapplication, improved visual acuity, and the most frequent adverse effects were reversible after PFC withdrawal. Moving on to the sixth and the final article that is going to be discussed during this session was by Prithvi et al. They described the clinical characteristics, multimodal imaging features, and the anatomic basis of a distinctive pattern of deep retinal hemorrhages located in the central cornea, a presentation they referred to as central bokeh hemorrhage. This was a retrospective observational multicenter case series of eyes from central bokeh hemorrhage. 10 eyes from 10 patients were included, and the underlying etiologies were neovascular AMD, lactic cracks and pathological myopia, macular telangiectasia type 2, PDR and ocular trauma associated with antioch strains. They found out that the central bokeh hemorrhage displayed a deep retinal hemorrhage with round margins in the central cornea and associated with petaloid hemorrhages radiating in the surrounding Henle fiber layer. Cross-sectional OCT showed a well-delineated round hyperreflective lesion involving the central foveal Henle fiber layer or the outer nuclear layer in all cases. Accompanying hyperreflective hemorrhages tracking along the obliquely oriented head base fiber layer were present in all cases. And they also found out that resolution occurred in all patients either spontaneously, that is 30%, or after treatment with intravital anti vegf in 70%, and was associated with partial visual activity improvement. Thus, they concluded that central bouquet hemorrhage is a novel descriptive term describing a characteristic round pattern of intraretinal blood in the folia associated with Henle fiber layer hemorrhage and encounter in a spectrum of macular disease. Thank you.